So oh. everybody, welcome to the initial hazardous waste management training. And thank you so much, Miles Mire from the system office. You work for the system office, right? Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> And so <laughs> for, for being here today and of course always every year sharing with us and um he's been going to every campus so um he's certainly very busy but thank you so much miles no problem my pleasure this is kind of where the exciting hits so anyway again if, if you guys are capable of putting yourself on picture i would love to see you guys uh it, it allows me to interact a little bit more um um, th this lecture can be very boring otherwise. It's, it's one of the more exciting topics that we have to go through life. Uh, but so I, I get a better grasp a, a little bit, so I know where I'm gonna go with this. Um, tell me who you are since the class is small and I do this when I'm, I'm in person, only because I think the better I get to, we get to kind of interact and know each other, the, the more it's easier to understand what I'm trying to get accomplished here. So Noah, uh, could you tell me a little about what do you do and what, why are you here? I guess is the question that we have I mean, other than being forced to come here. Um, uh, it's my second year in college and I'm, a, I'm here because um, I'm doing Inbre this semester. So Sally recommended that I do this before the semester starts. Okay, good. So you, so you, so you're doing biology uh, or, in, or uh, some chemistry stuff. So you, you're going to be handling hazardous material and doing some generation of what we call hazardous waste in some sense. Okay, good, good. So it gives me an understanding that maybe the program will be more meaningful than for you as I go through and why we do what we do. Okay, so thank you, Puna. I'm Puna. I work with Gear Up Maui. Um, I'm here because just to learn more about hazardous waste. I think I took it before when I worked at my last job, but um, just to familiar, familiarize myself, maybe it's different um, like through the college than from my last job. So, so what is your uh, Maui? We're a grant. Okay. We mean? work Maui. with um, our cohort is there are currently sophomores at my high school and King Kekaulike. Okay, so so you're a, a, a college prep mindset for the high school students to prepare. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right on. Hi, Susan. Hi, good morning. Hi, everyone. I am the acting Molokai coordinator um, this semester. And the reason I signed up for this workshop is because I just recently learned that if we provide antigen testing on site, the disposal of the materials has to be handled as a hazardous waste. And so I don't know the protocols for that and I, I wanted to be here to learn about it. Okay, just for clarity's sake, that falls under bio, biological waste. Oh, bio, yeah. Yeah, this is gonna be a really about chemical waste. Okay. So, so we, we, you and I can talk because there are okay. some guidelines that you guys will have to follow mm -hmm. um, and, and there will have to be probably some training that we're gonna to have to probably provide for you guys. Um, who's doing the antigen testing? Well, we, we don't, we're not sure. Um, it may be everyone here at the staff because you know we're single, individuals in and so depending on um who's here because we've already been affected by the rising um counts here on molokai we've had at least three people out um, because of um, proximity and possible exposure and so um, i just want to be everyone here to be prepared to doing the monitor monitoring the um the test as well you get a chance maybe you and i can have a conversation okay because i think there's something we can probably help and maybe i have some questions for you guys as far as how that apply um so that falls out of the preview of this class but so mm -hmm. we can have that discussion maybe we can kind of guide you in, in, in asking a different couple of different questions that might be beneficial for you for the ed center and stuff and the people okay. there. i appreciate it Mills. thank you couple hello I'm Kiapo. I'm also with Europe, like Puna, and again, work for a grant with kids, um, and we do a lot of traveling and place-based learning. Um, I don't know that we deal with too much chemicals, but we just thought it would be good to learn, and this was recommended training for us. Okay. 
I mean, is that your house or is it your work of employment? Um, this is a lovely virtual background. Oh, if I took this off, you'd see my office. I was getting jealous now. Like, wait, wait, why am I here? I, go <laughs> I wish, but yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Lehua. Aloha, my name is Lehua Ka'opio. I also work for Gear Up. Uh, we had a, a huge cohort at Maui High School as well as King Kekalike. Um, what do I want to learn? I like to learn everything. So, you know, information is, is you know, key. So, thank you. Okay, well, good. So, so it gives me an understanding of where I can go with this. I mean, the, well, I think the real person that, that is going to be managing and handling this stuff is actually going to be Noah. So uh, with Sally Irvin, she's kind of good. But I think it's really important to, to understand a little bit. So, so this program here is really kind of geared to try to, to educate uh, people who are going to be handling hazardous material to, and how they and when they generate hazardous waste. And there are clear definitions and, de and defining areas that how that works. Okay, so uh, sometimes people think of hazardous waste, hazardous materials are, are are kind of a little bit one way or the other way uh, when they generate waste. How do I manage it? And a lot of times in our public settings, uh, we end up throwing it in the trash can. We don't know we're throwing it in the trash can, right? And so this is kind of kind of given what the schools has got to do, especially for our community colleges. Okay, each of our, our University of Hawaii, the colleges work a little different in the sense that community colleges is separate from um, the University of uh, Hawaii Manoa, uh, as well as West Oahu, uh, as well as UH Hilo. So again, this program is solely for the University of Hawaii uh, community colleges. So let me go ahead and start this up and go ahead and share my slide here. And then, Bear with me because technologically just a little bit old. Here we go. Uh -huh. da, 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 da. And you guys gonna have this one of the reasons why I'm asking. You can you help me here? Can you see this? Yes. Great. Okay, let me see if I can get this to go to the beginning slide. Where is that? Mm -hmm. All right, let's see the slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. Okay, um, so this is our, our, our University of Hawaii's hazardous material, hazardous management, hazardous, hazardous material, hazardous waste management program. And what we're here to do is kind of teach you a little bit about the program. Again, we're going to try to provide as much as possible, but a lot in a lot of ways, there is a lot of material to get to understand in a short period of time. This program literally is, is two hours long, but depending upon where we go with this, it might be, I adapt things that go along. So anyway, this is me. Okay, this is how you get a hold of me. Uh, I got to change the address on that because I moved locations. But you know, one of the best ways, if you have a question and you can't get it from, um, say for like Noah from Sally, she's not available, you can email me. And I would tell you to email me is probably the most effective way because I'm kind of all over the place sometimes. When pandemic goes away, I will be out on the streets working all the campuses. So uh, email is always the most effective way of, of, of connecting with me because then I can really read it and, and can give you a good answer back. If I need to talk to you, I will call you and then we'll go from there. Okay, if it's really emergency, uh, you can try to call me. All right, let me give you a little background of myself so you understand a little bit of who you're listening to. Again, my, my, my name is Miles Nere. I, I'm a local boy, uh, but I grew up all over the country. My dad was military, so I, I'm a, a little different than most local guys. I grew up with this, agree, this, this assessment in my life that if I wanted something, I went after it all the time. But I moved schools every single year until I went to high school. Uh, I'm a Hilo High grad, so I'm a country boy. Um, but I went to college at the University of San Francisco, where I, I proceeded to get multiple degrees, which has nothing to do with anything, really, other than the fact that I went to school forever. Um, I have a bachelor's in biology. I was at one time thinking about being pre-med. <laughs> yeah, you don't want me practicing medicine. Um, but <clears throat> I went on to get a master's in environmental management, uh, where I, I spent the last 40 years in this field. Um, I worked at the University of San Francisco, where I created the program. I went to UC Berkeley, where I managed the hazardous waste program there. Um, University of California at Berkeley did well over 100,000 pounds of chemical waste a year. So it's a very large campus. Um, Manoa, who thinks they're a very big campus, may be large in size, but it's not a very hard science campus. It's really a social science campus where UC Berkeley does mostly hard sciences. And so it's a very different mindset a little bit. Um, I proceeded to come back home 
27 years ago, I brought my two daughters home where I raised them. Uh, I was consulting in the private sector for a numerous amount of years, um, managed a bunch of programs and a, a bunch of companies. Uh, ended up in 2000, let's see, 1998, going to the Department of Health uh, Hazard, Evi Hazard Evaluation and Emergency Response Group, where I was a project manager for them. Uh, I did that for a bunch of years. And then in 2000, I came here to the University of Hawaii Community Colleges, and I've been here ever since. Uh, my responsibility runs from everything from environmental all the way to fire. I am a one-man operation, a one-man record crew, as, as they some people tend to uh, identify me as. Uh, so I have a knowledge of, of a little bit of everything. Hazardous waste is where I started my career out, and this is probably the area I know best of, of it. So again, this is the way you can get a hold of me. These are some of the re regulatory websites that we follow, uh, of course. Um, the community college has a website, but I don't have a web designer to help me, so... We're kind of in limbo on this one, it says under construction, but Manoa's operation has a pretty good site that has some current things we follow just along that. Um, I, I follow EPA, Hawaii as a, as a state. Um, EPA is a federal, fund, federal guidelines. They are foundation on how we design our waste management program. And so what happens with that is, is we, in Hawaii, very luckily for us in Hawaii, we follow federal mandates. Uh, where I was in California, California added on top of that. So what the federal government likes to do is give you a foundation and says states you are authorized to manage. You can adopt or you can add on and make it more stringent. California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York have all made their rules a lot more stringent than, than the federal government has. Hawaii has pretty much adopted federal guidelines. So I follow EPA. Uh, so Department of Health is, is an offshoot basically of EPA and they're Hawaii's uh, Environmental Protection Agency. They manage all the uh, programs here. They manage a lot of the rules. There are some rules they tweak as we go along because Hawaii is a very different place uh, than the rest of the mainland. And then of course, the last one is HIOSH, which is Hawaii's Occupational Safety and Health Group, which is a, a branch off of the OSHA group, which is the federal guidelines to manage employees. Uh, so Noah, you're a student. So you're not getting paid, I'm, I'm assuming, because you're a student. So if you ever get hurt in a lab, OSHA doesn't care. Because OSHA only cares about employees who get paid. That doesn't mean we don't treat you like we treat our employees because the foundation of safety is the same whether you're a student or whether you're an employee. But OSHA, we, we follow their guidelines in how do we protect the employee. And, and so therefore, that is one of the organizations that I follow and, listen, and read all the time. This is the probably the most important thing we'll talk about at the all. And so at the end of the at the end of this this process, what I call, if you remember only one thing, one thing, then I win. I've done my job. Okay. And so what is and I want you to think about this. What is the most important action you can take to ensure that you are in compliance with hazardous material and hazardous waste regulations? Now, all those things pop up all over the place. And so reality comes out is what is the question? What is the answer? Well, here's your answer. It's called labeling. Information. I, I forget who's label. I think you talked to or somebody talked about, about wanting to, to know more, educate, to be educated, to be have an education. To me, education is, is probably the most important thing behind clarity. So clarity without education doesn't help. And education with less clarity doesn't help either. So when we talk about labels, that's information that's required on all my all the containers. Why? Because, because labels provide us a knowledge of what it is, and the clarity of that knowledge is how detailed can we put on the label to give us a description of that waste. Well, that applies more than waste; it applies to hazardous material as well. Uh, so anyway, as we go through this, this is the one thing that I think is the most important for all of us to understand. And, and you'd be surprised. I'm a kind of person that has gone through my, my, my short periods of life, as I call it, um, that I don't take the excuse, I'm too busy, I don't have time. To me, that's a cop-out. You always have time to label that container because if you have an unlabeled container, you create a disaster for all of us. Because if you don't know what it is, how do you manage it? How do you use it if you can use it? How do I get rid of it now? I don't know what it is. So labeling is ultimately the most important in managing hazardous material as well as hazardous waste. Okay, so again, as we go through it, we'll talk about more. This is where it all began. This is the designing where when hazardous waste regulations finally started to come in place. This beautiful picture in the black and whites, 
uh, is a place in upstate New York. And if you're older enough, you might hear about it, but most of young people have never heard about it. But this is Love Canal. This is Love Canal in upstate New York, where what they did was, it was pretty much an industrial uh, of community, a lot of, lot of plants and a lot of operations. And that's the Hudson River right next to it. And what did they do in the old days in the 50s, 60s and 70s? We buried our, every waste we had in drums and put it in the ground. So here, so about 22,000 tons of over 200 different chemicals were dumped in the ditch from 1942 to 1953. That's 11 years only. And then that, that color picture is what we all did in our good days of being typical of, of people is we buried the drums and then we proceeded to build homes on top of it. In 1972, they started noticing there were clusters of cancers coming out from the children. And then to research, it took a period of time to kind of go through the research and they finally discovered that the, the drums were leaking and leaching into the groundwater. And our children in these homes that we had built the Love Canal were starting to get contaminated and they were starting to create other problems and stuff. So things like this happened. So in 1976, they decided they were gonna regulate hazardous waste. EPA said, okay, we're gonna put laws in place to protect our people from our bad practices that we had done. Now, mind you, prior to all these rules, these were legal practices where people would just drain things on the, on the side of the road in the dirt and just pump it out or bury the drums and that was legal. That wasn't illegal at the time. Was it right? Well, at the time, again, legality of what they could do was, was okay. We found out through our actions what we had done was good. We created problems. And so in 1976, they created RICRA in 1976. They developed this waste management program called RICRA from EPA because of this kind of things that were happening and we were seeing all over our country. Okay. Even here in Hawaii, we did the same thing. Our landfills have, in the past, things that we were burying that should have probably have been buried, right? That's why if you think about your, 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 your regulations now, in commercial trash cans, so the big dumpsters, we literally cannot, legally cannot put any liquid in there. Because the landfill can't take liquid because they bury it. Because what happens with liquid is it eventually leaches into the ground and to, to, for us in Hawaii, groundwater, which is what we drink, right? So there's a lot of concern with it. So what they did was they created a, th a regulation called RICPA, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, 42 United States Code Law 1609, says, RICPA says this, we are responsible for hazardous waste generated now. This is not hazardous material, this is very different, but this is the production side, the end product from cradle to grave. And cradle means from the time you put it in a jar and call it waste to the time we dispose of it or, and destroy it. In the days of past, we thought it meant bury it. That did not qualify under the classification of grave. So therefore there was a lot of Superfund sites that opened up because they were redigging up the landfill. And basically what we were responsible for was destruction. So our waste that we generate here on the University of Hawaii Community Colleges, when I ship it out, it gets shipped out to incinerators for destruction. And so therefore we're not responsible for that at all. Okay, once it gets destroyed, the University of Hawaii is now Re uh, released of all liabilities of the waste they generated because it was destroyed. Okay, so it's really important for us to understand it. Okay, so the regulations basically talk about from cradle to grave, from the time we, we turned all this, this landfill, these dumps, these dumping off into things like the thing on the right, where we properly treat, we dispose properly, and how do we properly store our waste? Okay. Um, so those will become where we were to where we are now. And again, the pendulum swung and we are much better at it uh, in the industry side of it all. It doesn't talk about household. Household is a very different game, okay? So these are the federal regulations of 40 CFR, um, code of, 40 Code of Federal Regulations CFR section 260-280 is EPA's regulations on generating and managing and disposing of hazardous waste. It, it, it manages from the, from the generator to the transporter to the disposal guys who are responsible. In Hawaii, it's the Hawaii Administrative Rule, Title 11, okay? Pretty much the same regulations, maybe a little tweaking here and there because we are a state of Hawaii, okay? 
So this is kind of an interesting chart for us. These are the areas that, that I have to pay attention to in a sense of keeping us in compliance. So if you look at the far left side, it says OSHA, that's the employee side. Uh, we gotta make sure people are safe uh, working, whether it's in a laboratory or working in a classroom, uh, even working at your desk. <clears throat> we, we look at, I look at ergonomics and how do I make the environment safe for you? Was under OSHA's duty clause, which is a very vague, vague, vague clause, which they fall upon a lot in citation. It says this, we, the, and this is paraphrasing, just so you know, we, the employer, must provide a safe working environment for the employee. That's broad, but that means a little bit of everything, right? In other words, it means hallway spaces, uh, uh, aisle spaces, uh, it means even in the sense of ergonomics, uh, electrical, uh, it means a little bit of everything so that our job is to look at your operation to give you a safe operating procedure to be safe. <clears throat> so before pandemic, I used to go to outer islands at least every quarter and at least once a quarter, I would go through every building and, and do a, a fire related safety check through the hallways and spaces to make sure that there were cluttered hallways, uh, fire escapes weren't clogged, um, fire equipment weren't blocked, fire extinguishers were current, and, and, and those are kind of things, because that fits under the general duty clause of safe working environment. Okay, on the far side, <clears throat> the Department of Transportation, um, this is where labeling comes in really important, because without labeling, how do, I how do I drum the waste, and how do I ship it out? Because we're responsible for all the requirements from the Department of Transportation for shipping hazardous waste off our site. <clears throat> and so if you can understand how it works for us in Hawaii, is we have no disposal sites anywhere in the state of Hawaii. So therefore we ship everything to the mainland. Some of our waste sometimes, depending on what it is, may get shipped as far east as Florida. So DOT rules apply. So I've got to make sure all those, of course, because I'm the one that signs the manifest saying, I certify and understand all markings and labelings and packaging is proper and safe. And so therefore that side of the rule applies. Down the middle side, this is all the little things that we have to deal with. And so RICRA, of course, that's what that topic's about. We're gonna talk about that. But there's a thing called CERCLA Superfund, which is a, 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 a community right to know law. So in other words, we require inventory of all the hazardous materials that we have on property. Because at any given time, the fire department can ask us for the inventory because whatever we have on our site, the community has a right to know because it's a safety issue. Um, so that's important. So under Sarah, so Sarah uh, or Superfund first heard of 19, <clears throat> well, most of you guys aren't that old, in the early 80s, when they went back to those landfills we, saw, we showed you the pictures of, they were digging them up. And because we needed somehow to clean up those sites. And so it became a factor and, and, a, and a rule that went in place. Uh, there's a, the Clean Water Act, which is pretty clear. Uh, it is about everything that flows into your, our oceans. So we have storm drains around, around the city and on our campuses. Those things are, 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 we're protecting our oceans and our waterways, so we can't dump things down. Okay? Those rules are applied for that so that, that our waterways are kept clean. That came in pretty much <clears throat> with, in conjunction with two down below, the Pollution Prevention Act. The Pollution Prevention Act is kind of an offshoot of the uh, uh, Clean Water Act. It happened to occur in the 1980s. If you ever heard of the Exxon Valdez, that tanker that ruptured in Alaska. Well, the rules changed because of that. And that same year, California had a, a railroad car flip uh, and it dropped about, a, I think it was like 50,000 gallons of a, a chemical called rotenone, which was a fish kill that went in the Sacramento River all the way down to Lake Shasta and killed every bug and every organism in the river. Because the problem was before those days, no one regulated the tanker. The reason the tanker dumped all those crude oils in Alaska <clears throat> was the tanker hull was single hull, single wall. So when he hit the shoal and it ripped that, that tanker up, it exposed all that crude oil to dump into Exxon, it dumped into the, into the harbor. If you ever wanted to go look it up, I would go look up Exxon Valdez. And it was when Exxon dumped lots and lots of oil and it's got pictures of it that it's still talked about today. Environmental movements are really based upon a lot of that uh, where we change the rules because of those situations. Safe Drinking Water Act, again, pretty clear. The water you drink from the faucet, uh, it's gotta meet federal standards. 
Um, so they, so Board of Water Supply for whatever island we're on will check the water source to make sure that our water is clean according to federal standards, okay? Um, some people want to drink pure water and that doesn't exist pretty much anymore, but you know, because of our, our, our living on our, on our land, in the cane fields and the sugar cane and all that stuff, things are percolated to our water source, but it has to fit the federal guidelines so that you're drinking safe drinking water. So that's important. Clean Air Act, again, pretty obvious, everything we breathe. Okay, I'm responsible for evaluating what we emit into the air. Okay, so that's why in the hazardous waste laws, there are things about making sure caps are on all the time. So therefore that you will not let vapors flow in the air. Um, so. For us, I think Hawaii now has adopted almost all the gas stations. You know, when you go to the gas stations and you fill up gas, you see that, that little accordion thing that goes back and forth on the, the nozzle? Well, that is to trap the vapors that come off when you pump gas. Because the vapors add to our atmosphere. And so what they decided to do was we wanted to clean our air or keep our air clean. So they put it off. Now, Hawaii, because of trade winds, we're very, very lucky. Trade wind takes all our, all our pollution that we generate and pushes it out to the ocean, which is not good either, but it's, it dilutes it down with the rainwater into the ocean, so it doesn't cause as much problems. If you've ever been to LA, I don't know how many of you have gone to LA and, and been down there in the great days when the smog kicks in and you can't see the end of your fingers because it's so thick, those are, those are carbon pollutions. <clears throat> now, LA at one time, and I don't know if they, they did it, was gonna ban barbecue pits. So they were not gonna allow any more carbon burning of, 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 of charcoal or wood burning in barbecue pits. You were gonna be allowed to burn with propane or butane natural gas, because it doesn't emit the same thing. But can you imagine if Hawaii says you no longer can barbecue in your backyard or at the beach? What do you think we do in the state of Hawaii? We, 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 we succeed for the nation. They're not going to tell us we can't barbecue. Well, those rules were designed solely to protect the atmosphere. Again, because we're in Hawaii, we don't have the population. Uh, and because we have trade winds, we're pretty lucky we don't have that problem. But if you notice that when the Kona winds, uh, I guess um, that's politically incorrect now, the, the, the south winds blow back into the islands, you notice how the bog kicks in? Well, the bog no longer is part of it. It's also got pollution in it because if you look on your, if you have a white car and it looks on top, the bog and as it settles on your car, it's got a little brown. Well, the brown side is not bog. That's pollution. That's carbon pollution. So we are adding to our own problem. So the Clean Air Act was designed to protect our atmosphere as best as we could with the rulings. Okay, uh, EPCRA again. That's uh, part of EPCRA is, a, is a, an extension of the Community Right to Know Law, and FIFRA is a, a pesticide control law. Um, pesticides are controlled and regulated and mandated. Uh, the FIFRA law came in because what they found was probably the greatest mosquito repellent or uh, pesticide in the days of us old guys was DDT. And the days of when they used to pump, the, they used to have a pumper truck, wherever there's cane fields or there were pipe fields or, or anywhere else. I lived in Oklahoma for a while when there was locusts. They would have this pumper truck just pump out smoke. And that smoke had DDT in it. And DDT would kill the mosquitoes and all the bugs so that you know people wouldn't get sick. But <laughs> and us young boys, we used to ride our bikes behind it because we thought it was cool. So this kind of explains a little bit of my mindset at, at my age. Uh, but we stopped doing that because they found out that DDT, as it killed the bugs, the birds would eat it. The birds didn't care whether the bugs were alive or dead, they would eat the dead bugs <clears throat> and they would get DDT in their body. And DDT it became is a bioaccumulative, which means it didn't kill you but it added into your body and would get into organs. Well, they found out in the cranes in the Florida uh, um, uh, Gulf, they found out that a lot of the bald eagles and eagles and the raptor birds would each, uh, eat other birds that would eat the uh, uh, insects, their eggshells were getting really thin. And they couldn't understand what the, the population wasn't expanding or, or sustaining itself. It was, it was shrinking because the, the, the young eggs were not solid enough to be able to provide nutrients for the chicks and they would die. And they, they finally linked it to DDT. And that's why DDT is no longer used and we no longer have the pumper truck. So FIFRA became a factor in trying to regulate herbicides and pesticides. And for our campuses, 
we do not use any regulated pesticide or herbicide anywhere on campus. So we don't necessarily fall under the FIFA guidelines. But these are the kind of the rules that I've got to, I've got to manage and, and keep an eye on. So why do we have to comply with these regulations? What's the right thing to do, right? If, to manage hazardous waste is the right thing to do. Do it right, protect everybody and the environment is the right thing to do. We want to be good neighbors. Can you imagine if we got cited every year? What would, what would the neighborhood think of us? In fact, if we got cited every year, would you send your kids here? If no, if we got cited every year, would you come to college at Maui College? No, not even close, right? Because you've got to be wondering about your safety and what are they doing? So it is the right thing to do. And we manage that with a mindset that says that we're not being forced to because regulation says we have to. We do it because it's a smart thing to do and it is the right thing to do, okay? So we follow those guidelines, okay? The benefits of compliance, we maintain a good reputation. It really is important for a college to have a good reputation because if not, then nobody comes, right? <clears throat> we want to continue to attract students and for Manoa and a lot of the other colleges to attract grants. We want to make sure we get funding so that we can do other things. Well, if we are a violator, federal government is not going to fund us. They're not going to give us any money. So therefore, we want to continue to do that, right? Uh, we want to expand our programs. If we're spending money on, on hazardous waste violations and paying penalties, then we can't expand because we're trying to fight off all this stuff. At the end of the day, whether it's an education institution or it's a, a, a commercial entity or, or anything else, it's about the bottom line. If we're spending money on things we, we really don't budget for, then we can't do all the other things. We can't maintain a good reputation. We can't attract good students. The students will go elsewhere because the parents are not going to send their students, their young children, to a school like ours. <clears throat> and then, of course, all the other stuff, right? This is still about the bottom line. So penalties, these are some of the things that I pop up that I think is important. Bad press, again, if you had heard about Maui College being a campus that was constantly uh, exposing their students and faculties, getting fired, you, you, you would have news out there every day and it would be bad. It would lose our credibility, loss of all these kind of things. Uh, and injury would go up and all these kind of things would show up. And we wanna make sure that we don't have any of these kind of things. <clears throat> so EPA is very serious about the regulation. Here, these are, these are old numbers. I haven't got the new ones. I, I don't think it really matters that much to me. But in 2018, EPA levels, check this out, $471.8 million in civil penalties and fines. 170 cases went to federal, uh, to, uh, federal court as a criminal offense. So they're serious about maintaining it, right? <clears throat> so of the 170 criminal cases, 137 of them end up being criminal charge. That's serious. They're not playing games here. So they wanted to make sure we understood that. Now EPA is not in the rule, not in the business of fining or citing or criminally charging people. They're not. But they have the power to make the outcome so they can prove a point. So this was the interesting part. These are academic institutions. What happened was when I was at the University of San Francisco in 1980, 88, EPA came down to my campus because under the region nine area, region nine EPA is located in San Francisco. We were a private school and the other schools around us were, were public. So they have to notify the public schools they're coming. With the private school, they just knock on the door. Four o'clock Friday afternoon, I got a knock on the door. A guy showed up with a badge, says, hi, I'm EPA, we're here to inspect. Lo and behold, for him, it wasn't a good time for him to show up because our college is on Friday and no one's around. There's no, you know, people are not around at four o'clock Friday afternoon. So he, had, he, had, he came back Monday morning, which gave me a little time to get people a little aware of what was happening. Well, they came through us and they found, for, and we're a small college. We only had 3,000 students in, in that school, uh, which I was an undergraduate and a graduate student there. Um, they, so we, they found 17 potential violations in the one sweep in one of my science buildings on two floors. And we were following um, UC Berkeley got rules and regs, and we found that we had to modify certain things. We found things that people were doing that shouldn't have. Uh, but EPA at that time wasn't interested in finding us. They were interested in correcting the mistake. So EPA gave me 45 days to come submit a report that told us what we mitigated and what plans we had to make things better. And what they did was they worked with me, and they, they didn't find us today. EPA says, we are serious about this and we're gonna fine you for your violations. 
So as you can see, some of these things, they went after the universities pretty hard and heavy at, at, at probably a good five years stand in 2000, before 2000, they came after everybody. So you can see some of the violations they came up with. Yale, good school, $348,000 in hazardous waste violation. Notre Dame, $250,000 in Clean Air Act. And here, the one that I got hired right after because, because of the mandate, it got to hire more people. Because before the year 2000, the University of Hawaii Community College did not have an environmental safety specialist at all. They relied on Manoa to do it all. Manoa had hired, had its own problems, but a very small crew, and they didn't have. They still don't have enough people to manage Manoa, but that's how we operate in the state of Hawaii. University of Hawaii in 1998 got a 1.8 million dollar citation for hazardous waste violations, and most of that came out of Builder Hall, which is the chemistry building. 1.6, which is good for EPA because they said, we don't want really your money, but take $600,000 of that money or so, and we're gonna give it to, um, as a citation, actually it came out to two, $200,000, um, $200, uh, 60,000 of it went to fine fees, but $1.6 million they told us, okay, we want you to take our citation money and we want you to fix your problem which was a good thing. This is what I, I give the government credit for, is they mandated that the people violated had to go fix their problem. And so through that, we had a lot of programs come in place. We, we did a lot of substitution. So we went to all the labs and offered the labs to get rid of the mercury thermometers and go to digital or alcohol based, which create no hazardous waste, because mercury is a hazardous waste. We, we, we went to chemistry departments and said, look, we have money would you change over to microscale chemistry, which reduces the amount of waste generated? Now, when I was a student, I hated microscale micro chemistry because it required a lot more attention to it. Microscale, you can make a lot of mistakes and you have a lot of room for error and you still get come up with the results. Microscale became something that you had to really pay attention to. But the outcome was really outstanding because we went from macro levels of creating hazardous waste to micro scales of hazardous waste. So it was really good for, for us in general. Uh, we did a lot of things for the you know, Honolulu Community College. <clears throat> we went in and uh, gave the uh, off offset printer, the operator there to get rid of his offset printing machine to go 100% digital. We reduced his entire hazardous material inventory and went to no hazardous waste generation, because we went to, it cost us $300,000 to do that, but that came out of the supplementary environmental project report. So there were some really good things that came out of it. And call some, it included hiring a bunch of people to, help manage the program for the University of Hawaii. So, but these are real. And then of course, um, I was actually at UC Berkeley when my Stanford got hit for a million dollar citation for hazardous waste violation. Two years later, they didn't comply hundred percent. They got hit with another million dollar citation. So they're really real out there, okay? So it's really important to understand that why we created this kind of stuff, okay? So there are things like this. The penalties are up to 32,600 per day per item. And I have seen it go up over time. This is a max, there's a scale, so don't know. So, and then they went at 19, but 1994 or so, they decided to push criminal charges against people. I actually know one guy that went to jail for five years in a federal penitentiary for violating his permit. So it's real, okay? So what we do is we control the amount of stuff coming in. So we, we, we have the campuses understand that we like to have a, there's a procurement requirement that uh, any procurement of hazard material goes to the chair, then it goes to the vice chancellor for signature. And it is never to say, no, you can't order it, but it is allows us to have to know what's coming on campuses. Uh, if you bring in too much, I wanna know why. Because most people tend to buy macro scale and they don't use it all. And then they wonder why they have tons of it left over that no longer is usable and we have to get rid of it. So we want to kind of control that kind of stuff coming in. Okay. Because of that, we also help control the kind of waste production. Uh, we want to limit the amount of waste we can reduce. If we can recycle or reuse, and I'm all for that. Uh, when I was at UC Berkeley, we had a program that was a reuse recycle program. In fact, some labs with the waste they generated some research lab used it as material so we could process that through. So it reduced our waste stream a lot more. So those are the kind of programs we look at all the time. Sometimes we look at things like substitution. Can we reduce this hazardous material with something that's not hazardous? Because if it's not hazardous, at the outcome, it's not hazardous waste. 
So we reduce the waste stream, but we also do two folds. One, we get rid of the hazards so people working with it are not dealing with something hazardous and deal with something less hazardous. So we look at the idea, can we substitute the material so that we don't have a waste on the back end? Let me give you an example. There was a guy named Ron Takata, he was a professor at, at Honolulu CC. And what he was doing for his freshman chemistry or his, his first year chemistry, he was teaching density to show how density worked through solution. In the past, he used hazardous material and to be able to get the results he was looking for. He realized that he didn't have to. So he decided to switch to creating sugar in water. And then he created the same density result to show his students how density worked. So he took a non-hazardous material to generate the same results he was looking for. And he had a non-hazardous waste. So he completed two folds. One, his students didn't have to wear safety equipment because they were dealing with sugar water. And the other side, he had no waste disposal. He could literally dilute it down and pour it down the drain. So he created that less problems for everybody. So what we talk about is control material, we manage the waste, and then we try to minimize it. So it's a complete circle and everything else. And then we go back to managing our waste the material again. So the idea is, is everything's kind of interlinked to each other uh, through the beginning of purchasing to the end of when we dispose of things. So what is a waste? A waste is a useless byproduct of operations. So in other words, an A plus B equals C. Whatever you, you create, you mix something else, you produce, that production is a waste. It no longer is usable if you don't have a use for it. Uh, a material uh, which is to be disposed of or no longer used. In other words, it's something you bought and you don't like anymore, you want to get rid of it. It's called an off-spec. So whatever we do, we, we get rid of it, we get rid of, uh, throw it as a waste. You can't throw it in the trash can, so we have to ship it as a hazardous waste. That to me is the number one craziness of all times because why are you wasting money? Why did you buy it? You had no intention to use it. And so we try to teach people material purchases should be unusable by nature and not say, oh, you know what? I think I might use it sometime in the future. Well, the future shows up and all of a sudden you have no idea what to do with it. Or if someone retires, now I've got tons of this stuff sitting around and nobody wants to touch it. And I have to ship it off as hazardous waste. This is no longer viable to anybody else. It now is classified as a waste, okay? So how do you determine if the waste is hazard? Your safety data sheet has got an answer for you. You can read that. If you don't know what a safety data sheet, I suggest you find out what that means. That it comes under my hazard communication uh, class. And if you don't know what it is, you should attend that class. We can set that up for you as well. Uh, or, or you can call me. Okay, you can tell me a little bit about it and I'll let you know one way or the other. So these are the exclusions of waste. Okay, or well, what is the definition of waste? Of all materials that come into waste. There's excluded waste. Waste doesn't fall under the RICRA side. Okay, they're under the federal guidelines of what is a hazardous waste. There are nuclear waste, domestic sewage, uh, clean water, point sources, and irrigation water. Don't fall, those fall out of the game. Okay, they're not regulated by the government as a hazardous waste rule. So the government had lawyers write this rule up and they said, well, we define things as solid waste. Now solid waste in the definition of the regulation and the law means gas, liquid, and solid. In other words, all states, okay? It falls under some of the definition of solid waste. Well, this is how we determine whether it's hazardous and what determination fits in. Is it a, a waste that's not hazardous, which is your trash? Things that go in the trash can, that's okay. Right, things that are not hazardous by the nature of the game. Then we have a thing called non rigor hazardous waste. These are not federally regulated hazardous waste, but are hazardous. Uh, so Noah, you're in the science, bio, you're in the biology world. In the days of the past, I don't know if Sally's using this. We used to use a thing called ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide is a great um, a chemical. It dies when we used to do DNA testing and proteins, it would, you put it into the solution and it would dye the DNA. So you, when you do it in electrophoresis gels, it would show the fluorescent markings of the DNA and RNA. Great product, excellent product. Problem is, it's a mutagen. Where 50, 270 milligrams of this material will kill 50% of the population. It's hazardous, but the federal government doesn't regulate. So people say, well, it's not hazardous. No, that's not true. It's not regulated federally, but we call it a non rigor waste. Therefore, we still need to get rid of it properly as a hazardous waste. And then it falls into the next game of the regulated waste. And we'll explain a little bit of this uh, in a short while. And then we have a thing we call acutely hazardous waste. These are things that are highly toxic, cyanides, uh, sodium azides. Some of the things that actually can really hurt people uh, and, and the environment are regulated very differently in that sense, okay? 
So how do we know? Well, we, we look at our waste. So is it a RIC or waste? And I'll explain that in a few seconds. Does it have the rate? Does it have the codes? Yes, it, it disposes of the hazardous waste. No, it doesn't have uh, RIC or codes on it. So it doesn't fill in that guideline. Well, it, does the Department of Transportation regulate it? In other words, when I ship it, does the regulation apply that I got to apply it as a hazardous material logo on it? And if it's yes, then it goes off as hazardous waste. No, it doesn't fit under the DOT. Okay, so can we drain, dispose, or landfill? In other words, can I throw it in the trash can or pour it down the drain? Well, we have permits for that as well. Does it fit the permit uh, as far as can it go in the trash can? Yes, therefore, then it can go down. But if it doesn't fit it, no, it goes as hazardous waste. So you see, the tree is not that difficult, but you got to know the materials you're working with and you got to know the regulation. That's why we tell people when in doubt, you ask questions. Don't assume, don't take things into your own hand if you're not sure, because you might be violating the rules and you don't wanna violate the rules, okay? So when do you know hazardous waste is generated? You ask my dog, he'll tell you. Um, but the idea is this, we have a program and inside your program and the campus has it. Uh, if you don't have one, somebody asked me, I'll make sure we get you one. Uh, I just re revised it in 2018. Every so many years I go through and change the regulations. Um, but it says we, we're, we're to comply. Basically, the rules say we need to comply with all the rules that apply. Who's responsible? Actually, the end, end guy starts with the chancellor, but the vice chancellor of administrative services is, for, for my ways, David Tanamaha, is responsible for managing the program and designating. Now, everybody down below that is responsible for managing their own program, department chairs and directors, and down to the individual direct, uh, the PIs, and down to the students themselves, or the class, uh, the, the uh, uh, APT is working there. So no, as you're a student in the lab, as you generate stuff, you're the one that generated, right? Therefore, you're responsible for that waste. So you got to follow certain guidelines to make sure that it's properly managed, or you got to let somebody know how to manage it so they know what it is. Otherwise, what you generate, they're not always going to know what it is. And therefore, who's responsible? False you, in a sense, for information. Okay, again, the information is key. Okay, so we, we have, that's why we have the training. The initial is required the first time you go through it. And after that, we have a one, every year we have a refresher. We go back to remind people, to remind them of, of the rules. And then is there any changes that come with the rules, okay? So again, we have strategies of these kind of things. We have an authorization purchase form. Uh, there, if we're doing research, there is a, a research form to fill out that requires a very extremely hazardous stuff. You guys have never used any of that stuff, so we never have to follow the guideline. But I look for, I expect inventory of the campuses twice a year of the materials. Reason we did that was in, in October 1st, by that time, the campuses would have fulfilled all their inventory for the year. We asked for May 1st, but by that time, pretty much inventory is down. You should be ordering for the next year. You know what it is. There's two factors for that one. One is economics. Um, if you know what you have, you're not going to order more unless you really need it. In the days of the past, people were ordering over and over and over again. And they were stockpiling stuff that at the end of the day, I spent money to get rid of it. 20 years ago, when I first got hired in 19, well, 21 years ago now, in 2000, we went through every campus and we started to clean house. We found chemicals that were dated back to 1960s. And this is the year 2000. And there were extra bottles of the same material stored in the store. No one knew what they had. We spent almost $30,000 getting rid of waste to clean house. So inventory allows us to manage that in itself. The other reason inventory becomes important is that we know what we have. So therefore we know what safety data sheets we're required to have because that's required by law. Actually, there's a third reason for it. If we audit, re-inspect our inventory that twice a year, we will find chemicals that are off gassing or uh, hydrating or dehydrating. And the bottle looks like a mess and we need to get rid of it. So that's why inventory is important, okay? Um, we have a waste inventory program. These are the forms. Again, we just go through them real quickly. We designed these forms a long time ago to give us an idea. Um, so there's generation of accumulations. We are classified, uh, I gotta change this name, they changed it. We used to be conditionally exempt small quantity generators of hazardous waste. That means we generate less than uh, 100 kilograms of hazardous waste on the facility. Okay, so Maui College, that means all of Maui College, okay. Uh, it's now, we, the government spent a lot of money. They've now changed the name, but not the, not the rules inside. It's called very small 
quantity generators of hazardous waste. I don't know why they did that for, but anyway, they changed it. So again, this is what we have to follow. We should not be generating more than 100 kilograms of hazardous waste per month on the campus, okay? That's why it's important for me to go through and ask for the waste audits to make sure what we're generating. And that's why it's important to ask questions to make sure what we generate so it may not fall in that category, even though you may think so, okay? It's really important to understand that, okay? We can store up to 100, 1,000 kilograms on campus. That's why we don't ship more than once every two, three years, because we don't have that, that volume to do that. And because economically, I have to ship from Maui to Honolulu, from Honolulu to the mainland. It costs money, right? And so we want to regulate those kind of things. That's interesting, okay? So the idea of designation, if you're going to have waste, we recommend that you designate a, a location in your lab to where you store it. It should be identified, okay? And under control. It doesn't have to be locked up. It just needs to be under control, okay? So I don't like the idea of storing waste or materials under a sink or near a drain. Why? Because if it gets into the drain, it goes into our, our sewage plant and it could destroy things. If it's under a sink and the, and the sink cracks and water leaks, and if it's a, a problem that reacts with water, we've got a bigger mess on our hands. So therefore, I don't like it being stored under sinks or near drains, okay? There's a, we have a, a storage of a hazardous waste tag, which was created. Uh, this tag was, I, I, I created this when I was at UC Berkeley. It passed Cal EPA uh, muster, we brought it home. Department of Health actually likes seeing it because it gives all the information on it. So we ask people to put these tags on. And they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, for the sciences, you have uh, Marilyn York, which is really good with this stuff, so that helps you guys a lot. Uh, but we ask people to kind of understand what these tags mean. Uh, so it gives me an idea of the constituents that you are in it. This is important. Again, if you are going to be adding waste to a waste container, should you not know what's in the waste container before you put more waste inside? Because if you've mixed an incompatible, it will react and will either off gas or it will bubble up or worse yet, depending on what you put in, it may expand rapidly, which creates that problem. So it's important to know what you're putting in, but you have to know what you're putting in before that, so you know what you're putting in. And for me, I want to know percentages. I know it's a guess, but the best guess, because if you give me a waste tag that says 95% total, I gotta wonder what's in the other 5%, that could cause us a lot of problems. So again, best guess, okay? Uh, we ask you to pH it. pH gives me a great indicator which way it flows because if it's an acid or a corrosive, you know, there's certain things that you can't add to it, right? And so it becomes really important for that kind of stuff. Okay? Uh, the backside, we were told that this had to be on. Basically what it tells me is if you know what you're working with, you'll know what this, 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 this is. If you're working with uh, carbon tetrachloride, most chances that A plus B doesn't give you a complete reaction to give you C. There's always going to be in the waste stream A plus B and C, because it doesn't, it's not a full reaction that goes through. So if I got carbon tetrachloride in my A side, chances are carbon tetrachloride is going to be in my C, my, my waste side. So if I see it, I'm going to check it off. If I check it off, it has a D19 on it. Well, EPA says this, if it has a cold, then therefore it is an EPA regulated RICRA waste. And I'll explain this in a second. Okay, so let me go above that. It says, is it a RICRA or non RICRA waste? How do you know? Well, if it's a RICRA waste, is it flammable? Again, you should know the material you're working with. Is it flammable? Well, flammability feels under a 140 degree Fahrenheit or less. Again, if you're working with a material, you better know it's flammable, right? So if it holds that flammability, is it flammable on the wayside? You, it depends what you mix it with again. So again, you got to know chemicals versus waste production, right? If it is flammable, it has a D001. Therefore, it's a RICRA waste, right? Which is a flammable waste. Uh, oxidizers. Again, if you don't know what you're working with, this could be a problem. Oxidizers. What's an oxidizer? Oxidizers adds fuel to a fire. In fact, the greatest bomb in the world was made 100,000 years ago. It was fertilizer. And, and, and um, feces, or what they call ammonium nitrites, is an inorganic, or you can make multiple cocktails kind of thing. You put an inorganic material with an organic material, and when you ignite it, the inorganic material will reduce oxygen to help the fire grow. So do you know it's an oxidizer? Is it a nitrite? 
nitrate is not necessary an oxalate, but nitrate is. So therefore, it would fit under D1. And therefore, as a D1, it now is a liquid waste. Those are important because I cannot store an uh, oxidizer waste with a flammable waste, organic flammable waste. Again, information and clarity information becomes really critical in how I pack my waste. Corrosive. Corrosive corrosive D02. If you were, that's why I asked for a pH on the front side, right? So corrosivity for the acid side says corrosive from pH of zero to two. Three is not a corrosive waste. It's still corrosive, but it's not a corrosive on the EPA. Therefore, three doesn't get a D2. But if it's a pH of two or less. Now, D2 for corrosivity also applies to the caustic side. So if you pH a solution and it has a pH of 12.5 or greater than 14, it's a corrosive, but it's a caustic. So you still carry the D2 code, which carries a Richter code. pH is important in front because if you tell me it's a pH of two and I put a pH of 13 waste inside that bottle, what's gonna happen to the waste material in the bottle? It will react. Okay, it's a neutralization activity, but it will react. So therefore that information is critical again, okay, to know what the pH levels are. Now, why they didn't separate them, I do not know. Okay, I, I can tell you this, that whenever the rules were applied, whoever had lobbying power sat in front of Congress and argued. So for corrosivity, let me go back to corrosivity, the uh, D002, the acid side was pH of two, not three even though there's a tenfold difference in corrosivity, is because the food industry had lobbying power. For most of us who were older, you used to put nails in Coca-Cola and watch Coca-Cola dissolve the nail. Well, Coke syrup was a pH of three. So can you imagine a Coke syrup truck driving down the road with a corrosive symbol on it? It wasn't gonna fly. So they lobby EPA to reduce it down to a two, okay? So that's why I say it depends upon how lobbying group works. Reactivity, D3, things that go boom, blows up, or reacts violently. If you add acid with a cyanide, it produces a cyanidic gas, that's a D3. If you add a, a sulfide to a, an acid, it gives you sulfur, sulfide gas, it, that's a D3. Or if you add a, a, a sodium salt that is water reactive, it will expand and explode. That's a D3, it's a reactive. Those regulations fall into those things. And I can tell you about sodium salt. I own the fountain at the University of San Francisco, it cost me $5,000 to repair it because I threw sodium salt into it. And it blew up because the mineral evaporated away and the water came in and it blew up. It has a good story when you were there, but <laughs> it cost me. Toxic. EPA could not come up with a ruling that says what is characteristic toxicity because it would require testing of everything they had. That's why things like ethidium bromide are not classified because nobody wants to test it. So what they came up with was a list of things and they came up with a list of about 41, 39, 41, actually, see, 38 items, 30, yeah, no, 38 items of things that they would regulate from arsenic to vinyl chloride. So if any of your material has this in the waste stream, it hits one of those check marks and therefore it is now regulated under the characteristics because they couldn't come up with a way of having everybody test it. So therefore they said, this is a list of things. So this is how you classify RICRA versus non -RICRA, right? So basically generates a waste label, containers should be closed at all times. You cannot have a funnel in a container and leave it there you can only put the funnel in when you are adding liquid to it. If you have it in there and a specter shows up, that is a citation, okay? And that is to me a low hanging fruit, a bad citation. It has a couple of rules. One, it protects all vapors from going up, so you don't have a clean air issue. You can imagine all the labs in the country doing that. Uh, it also prevents it from being spilled when it's just standing there. So make sure, uh, make sure they're not leaking, make sure they're not cracked or bulging. Uh, you should group your waste in compatibilities. Again, you better know what you're working with, right? So you don't want to mix an oxidizer with a flammable liquid, so they shouldn't be stored next to each other unless there is some kind of barrier. 
Uh, if you have liquids, it should be in a secondary containment unit, like the one on the bottom, you see those pictures with those jars inside a bucket, that's a secondary containment, okay? Um, the fifth one is really weird. We don't, we store less than 55 gallons of waste in any building anyway. Uh, and then less than one kilograms of, of acutely toxin that you guys don't have. I think you have some cyanides, but again, they're not much of them. Okay. Unknowns. Again, if you remember anything, this is the big one. I do not like unknowns. In other words, there's no label on it. Does anybody can tell me what's in the bottle on the right? No. But here's the problem. Somebody's got to figure it out. Because I can't inventory it and I can't ship it. Which usually means they fly me in. And they ask me to go open it up. I'm not happy when I have to open up containers that I have no idea what's in it. Because there are things that can go boom. I was on Maui in 2001 when they brought me in. We found six bottles. Actually ended up being 16 bottles. It took me two full days to field categorize those things to be able to figure out what it was. It took one of them six hours because we went round and round in circles trying to figure this out. Because I got no equipment on the islands to run into a lab. To run an unknown to a chemical lab can cost us between $1,400 and $2,500 per sample. We don't got that kind of money. So the idea is make sure that if you know what's in it, you label it before you go away or before you do anything. Because when you leave, no one knows what's inside that thing. And again, labeling helps because you don't want to mix unlabeled things together, correct? So again, make sure you label everything, okay? These are some of the various things that are under control for us. Batteries, oops. batteries are, are, are collectible except for alkali. Alkali is sometimes in every ready batteries and Duracell. Um, and as long as they don't say NICAD or lithium, if they're alkali, they can go in the trash, everything else gets collected. Uh, biological, those are the things that Susan, you and I have to have a discussion about. Um, controlled substance, those are drugs, you don't worry about that. I had to go to Arkansas from California once because I had to follow a tractor trailer that was carrying uh, controlled substances to my disposal site. In other words, DEA wants to regulate, no matter hijacks the load going off. And so we don't, we don't have any compressed cylinders. We regulate that highly carefully because to get an unknown cylinder, it cost me $10,000 just to rent what we call a, a gas a coffin, just to ship the unknown out to get sampled before I can even ship it to somebody to get disposed of it. So compressed cylinders are really, really important to be, make sure the label stays on. Fluorescent light ballast and tubes, again, you don't need to know much about that, but light, light tubes we collect. The light, ballast, the light tubes have mercury in them and we recycle them. Of course, hazardous chemicals and which hazardous waste is what we're talking about today. Mercury is a waste. We collect all mercury in, in thermometers, even though I used to love playing with thermometers and break the mercury, uh, it is a toxic, okay? Don't eat that sucker because it'll hurt you. Uh, Non-hazardous waste, we throw away in trash. I collect oils and transform fluids. Waste paint, we collect paint that's oil-based. Again, uh, photographic chemicals. Uh, we collect the fixers because they have silver and nitrate. Silver is a regulated waste, it's a heavy metal. And, and um, color printing solution has a hydroquinone inside. Hydroquinone is a, a, a poison and therefore we, we collect that stuff. Uh, radioactive material, pretty obviously, we take care of that. There is no disposal site for radioactive material. There's a repository. We hope for it to half decay away so that we can do something with it. Um, and we all know that now there are places like in uh, Tri-Cities, Washington, which is hand filled, they're trying to clean it up because it was buried in the caves down there, all the radioactive waste that's there. So we manage all that stuff. In fact, here's one. Do you know all the signs that say exit that are self-fluorescent, the one that glow in the dark? You know, they're, they're kind of replaced now, but those had tritium in. We regulated those. When contractors take away exercise, we take them away with us so we can dispose of it. So those are regulated. Sharps and glassware, uh, there are ways of managing that. And again, your labs can talk to you about that kind of stuff, okay? Simple enough, no hazardous waste or chemicals can be disposed in trash, landfill, or in the drain. Please, please, please don't do that. Please talk to me first before you do anything so we can have a discussion. Uh, for you um, 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 Maui guys that are in the classrooms, uh, for the high schools, make sure you check with the chemistry professor teachers there what they do with the stuff. So I don't know what the high schools are doing. I don't regulate or manage them. Okay? Uh, but we hire a, a contractor to come in to package and ship all our waste from all our campuses. Again, Maui, it goes from Maui 
And this is why I really get very, very um, animate about to making sure that you properly label it because my vendor has to get a list and he will pack it according to the list on paper. He will come into the campus with the amount of drums that he has to pack for the amount of chemicals he has with a few extras. And they gotta be in the, they can't just put every bottle in every drum. It's gotta, it's gotta be very like-like material. Otherwise they will react cause problems. And he will pack it accordingly, fill it up with vigor, to make you like, he will mark the drum and label it as hazardous waste for transportation. He will fill out a manifest. I will review all the paperwork. I will sign it. That goes from, for you guys of Maui, it goes from Maui College by truck to Young Brothers. Young Brothers looks at the manifest and figure out where can I put these drones without having it cause problems for me on my, my barge. They will ship it from Maui to Honolulu where they will unload the barge put it on the ground, a truck will come by and pick it up and transport it to the contractor's warehouse where he would take it from the truck there onto a container. He will load the container. Again, he's got to know what's in the containers because he's got to, there are shipping requirements of what you can store next to each other and what you cannot ship in that container at all. He will take the container, re-manifest it, and he would take it from there to Matson. Matson will review the manifest and he will take the container and he will plan where he can put that container on his container ship. The Matson uh, uh, controllers are very serious about this because they don't want that waste container in the middle of the boat. Because if something breaks and something starts to react, they're gonna cut it off the core and they're gonna throw it off in the ocean because they got to protect the $4 billion boat and the 10 crewmen that are on that boat. So that's why that information is critical for us to pack properly. Well, that mass and container goes to one of three ports, either Tacoma, Oakland, or Long Beach. It gets taken off the boat, put on the ground where a transporter will pick it up and he will sign the manifest as receiving it and he will drive that, that container across the country into a disposal site. That is why I am so animate about labeling and proper labeling because we are responsible. We, the University of Hawaii, is still responsible for that waste. I have a friend of mine long ago, it was packing, it, it, UCLA packed their container. He made a mistake of not verifying what was in the drums. That container got picked up from UCLA, it was driving to El Dorado, Arkansas. When five miles before it got to the facility, something must have happened because the truck started to smoke and it caught on fire. He drove the container into the yard because the yard guy says, bring it here, it's safe in here, then out in the street. And that thing got doused and he had to unpack it and figure out what caught on fire. They were lucky. It could have been huge. So that's why, again, I'm very much about labeling everything and knowing what we have because that inventory becomes everything to us, okay? Again, must be labeled, leaking, incompatible, must be separated, okay? So these are some of the things we're allowed to drain disposal. Again, when you're in question, ask me, I will tell you what can and cannot, okay? We store according by, by hazard class. Uh, we, we've come up with this simple one. Uh, if it fits one of these categories that you don't store next to each other. Corrosive can't go next to ignitable. Uh, any liquid stuff I don't like putting next to any reactive. Um, how to poison stuff, you should be careful where you store it next to ignitable and stuff like that. So we can have a discussion. There's a big chart. The chart's a wall size and it's just too large. We're going to come up with something simpler for everybody else. But if, when you're in doubt, call again, okay? This can help you there. So the way the rule works with separation of incompatibles, it either has to be separated by barrier. That's why the temporary tubs is a barrier because you can't leak into the next one or distance. And distance by the government says 25 feet. Nobody's got 25 feet to store incompatible. So we allow store by barriers and you can do barriers, you can do barriers, okay? Uh, I would, uh, well, I used to do audits. <laughs> I, I don't know when the next time I'll come around to do an audit of the campuses. Um, Molokai, I used to come by once every two years to, to audit the facilities. Uh, but this is why we do audits. We see these kind of things. This happens to be Koala Basins, but you see the UH Manoa. Well, my buddy went to audit and he decided to look for things and he found things like this. These are lithium batteries. Why would somebody throw them in there? In a, I don't get this. 
Lithium batteries are hazardous, but what happens is, is when they get wet, they ignite, they smolder. That's why lithium is very cost. Do you realize that when you order something from, from somewhere, you cannot, Amazon won't ship you a lithium battery to Hawaii because they won't be putting it in a transport plane. Everything that comes over to us that has this kind of stuff comes by boat, okay? Uh, that's why airlines, they don't want you putting your laptop underneath your, uh, your luggage. They want you to hand carry it. Because at one time, the FAA wanted to ban all lithium batteries on the airplane at all. How would that be if you couldn't travel with your phone? Wouldn't work, would it? So they want you to put it in your carry-on so that in case something happens, it is something we, they can control. They can try to put it out. But if, if a lithium battery catches fire in the hold, who's down there? No one, right? And a, and a smoldering fire of a, of a, a flammable metal burning at 35,000 feet in an aluminum plane is not good. But audits do this kind of thing. We find these kind of things. But this is what happens when we're done auditing. We clean up our stuff. And it's important to manage, okay? Because, so if you go back to this, how much of that stuff was waste? People just threw there and didn't care to have materials left over. So again, audits do a great deal. Audits also do this for us. We look at different things inside the cabinet. This is a blue cabinet, which is a corrosive cabinet. And inside of it down there, there are some flammable liquids in there. And flammable liquids and corrosives are incompatible. And that's what audits do. They help us find these things. Helps us do this. This is one of my our shops when I first got hired. What would they think of when they did stuff like this? This kind of thing. This is bad. This is bad housekeeping in general. Audits help us find this. How long do you think this was sitting there before this thing was ever discovered? Inventory helps us do this too, twice a year, right? Because that makes us go through an inventory. How do I tell an inspector, oh, inspector, um, uh, yeah, that's still usable. We're gonna use it one day. That's an awful hard argument. Basically what it did was it hydrated and it expanded in the container and that's why it cracked. This one too, okay? These are important what we, what we look for. I, this was on my campus. I found this in the trash can. I'm glad it says don't touch. It had mercury, but it was in my trash can. They're going to throw it in the trash. Mercury is a, is a highly toxic material. Good material, great material, but it shouldn't go in the landfill. So the idea is when we do audits, we teach you how to take care of spills. Now, if you are in a lab, the lab will teach you how to manage spills. And therefore, I'm not going to get into this. But if you are working with hazard material, you should know how to manage a spill to clean it up and the proper way of cleaning up. And that also means the proper PPE to wear it on time, okay? Minor spills are easy to clean up. Major spills call for help. You guys don't have anything on campuses that cause me major spill. That suit is what they call a level A hazardous material suit. It's called a moon suit. That suit is disposable. It's $5,000 for a disposable suit. I was in one of those once. On a, on a spill of an unknown in Berkeley. I had 20 to 30 minutes of airtime in that thing. That's it. It's very claustrophobic. And you were there with only breathing what you have in the tank inside. So please be sure that we label everything because an unknown spill was in a fire department and looking like that. Hey, okay, minor spills, again, you can neutralize. Go talk to your lab, the lab will help you out. Uh, and if you want more, you can talk to me. Uh, even for your high school guys, the, the lab should know what they're doing. The, the teachers should know what they're handling. Uh, clean up is pretty straightforward. Again, if you, you should know what materials you're working with because it'll tell you how to clean it up. Okay, Major spills, call for help. Okay, report everything. You got a minor spill report to your lab manager, okay? Or tell somebody of, a, of, of, of responsibility there was, a, there was a spill and you had to clean it up because therefore we kind of will go back and investigate to figure out how do we could solve that problem. Was it an accident that just, just happened or was it because somebody mismanaged something? Uh, or we can train people. I've had to train people how to carry bottles because there's, there's actually a safe way of carrying bottles. Um, we had a young man here on, on Manoa actually was carrying a Dewar flask. A Dewar flask was a flask that you can put liquid nitrogen inside. Uh, and he uh, didn't check the, the container and there was a crack in it. And when he poured the liquid nitrogen on it, it imploded on him, okay? So again, there, there are ways of doing things properly. 
Uh, that is reported all. Okay, our job is to minimize as much as possible. We want to reduce all our waste. Uh, we want to reduce our materials. Um, and when I was growing up, going to school, we Hawaii bought things in what I call the Costco mold. Let's buy a case. Let's buy a pallet because we'll never know where we're going to ship the game because it came by boat. Well, it no longer has to be that way. Manufacturers will now ship you or distributors will ship you smaller amounts what you need. And that's why we like inventory. Inventory tells us what I have, so I don't have to reorder. And the story I've always used before, I was I asked by Kenny Ikeda, which is my counterpart at the University of Hawaii uh, Hilo campus, to come help him go through the uh, chemical stock room, which is pretty large, because no one had gone through it. So he and I went through every bottle and we pulled out and we, we were evaluating for the inventory. We found 40 bottles, 40 little bottles of ammonium hydroxide. Not necessarily top bad, but caustic material. They dated back to 1964 from the plantation. Why, were we, why did we have so many bottles? So I went to talk to the professor, the chair at the time, how much ammonium hydroxide they use every semester. And he says, my labs probably use maybe two four liter bottles. Well, they come in four four liter bottles per case. Why were they ordering a case almost every semester? They didn't need to. They had no inventory. So the idea is we had to get rid of all those containers because nobody wanted to touch them because they don't know how good it is anymore and nobody wants to play with. So the idea is now for us to really think about what we're going to return, what we buy. Inventory helps us because if you know you have it and you know how much you're pretty much going to use, you know that you're not going to order another case until you have to order a case preempted. Okay, so inventory becomes really important. Okay. And again, we want to minimize, we can, we can neutralize weak acids and weak bases. Again, your labs will know this. I won't talk much about it, but we can drain dispose certain things. It's not happening. And the question in life is, if you don't understand everything you got, ask questions. We're all in the educational world. Somehow it slipped us to ask questions when we don't know. The other part that I always I, I always teach and I always believe in and I do this in everything I, I talk about, whether I'm consulting or whether I'm building businesses, is that knowledge is only as good as the clarity of the knowledge. If you're unclear, ask some more questions. Don't go assuming. Ask for clarity. So therefore, it helps you protect you and protects our environment. All right, I wanted to cut through this as fast as I could. I know you guys have other things to do. Um, if you're in doubt, uh, for you, no, make sure you talk to Sally. Talk to um, uh, um, Marilyn York. She knows she's our APT. She knows what to, how to handle the waste. She knows all the answers to that stuff. And when in doubt, uh, you can get this from I guess um, Joyce. My email address is on this. If you, if you want it, I'll give it to you now. You can email me anytime. I will answer any questions you have. Uh, it's n i r e i at hawaii.edu. I'm very good about answering email. I am a one man team. I answer email on vacation because there's no one else who can answer it. So therefore you will get an email. Um, I, my, my, my policy is this, you will get a response from me within 48 hours. Okay, if I didn't, it's because I totally forgot. Please forgive me, I am old, right? Okay, any questions? Anything I can help you with? Any clear, clarity that you need? Because I did go blind this pretty fast, I apologize. Most of you are never gonna deal with this at all, but it's good to know the rules are there. They are serious about the rules, okay? Anything else? Um, there's nothing in the chat. Thank you so much, Miles. There's and something in the chat. See you at 11. There's something in the chat. It says, great job. That was amazing. Okay, don't awesome, throw, Miles. I used to say throw money, but I had kids in college, but I don't have kids in college anymore, so the money's okay. <laughs> Next time I come tomorrow, I bring food. <laughs> I hope I get to